Okay. So, figures, as soon as I decide to start, then somebody comes in. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. Hi, <laughs> So, welcome everybody to Ned Camp and Rhode Island College. Um, before I start, I wanted to say something, um, basically just about being here, um, that uh, really kind of struck me yesterday coming back to, uh, to this campus because my web career actually started on this campus over 20 years ago. When I was a student studying graphic design, my job on campus was to create the school's first website. And that was taking over from the rogue website put together by the students in the computer center that used to be downstairs in this building that was built out of a 486 Pentium that they literally pulled out of the dumpster. Wow. Uh, it was really kind of amazing. I mean, it was a really fun time, but I think it actually is, is kind of emblematic of what the web industry is still like. Um, it's still people just figuring stuff out. And what I think is really wonderful about it is throughout this career, um, starting off presenting this to uh, President John Nazarian at the time, um, showing him what the web was in Mosaic, and then trying to figure out how to apply graphic design Mosaic. Um, you know, thinking about graphic design and, and type and how we actually do layout when there wasn't a table tag. Um, there wasn't really anything for layout other than alignment. You could align something to the left or center, and that was, that was pretty much it. You couldn't even change the background color. It was gray, and that's really all you would get. Um, so uh, thinking about that and, and then thinking about the kind of stuff that I'm going to show you today, um, really was pretty remarkable to kind of think about that journey of what that's been like because I really love type. Um, I discovered my love of type when I was a student here and uh, in studying graphic design, collecting uh, type samples and all of this, this stuff, but then when I would go to work on something in the web, the best you could do is open up Photoshop, make a graphic of it, save it out in the smallest color palette you possibly could, um, trying to delete individual colors to get the smallest file size and then test it in all these different browsers and, and hope that it just doesn't look terrible when, when somebody views it online. Um, things are better and yet not any different today, um, but we have uh, some really interesting new developments in technology that are paving the way for us to really reinvent the way we think about design and think about design for the web. And, and that's what makes me really excited about this because I'll be showing you stuff today that is 100% shippable. What I ended up deciding to do is I, I started, I originally wrote this talk for an event apart in Seattle in April and it was done the way I've always done all of my talks which is in Keynote and lots of animations and what I found in doing that was what I kept doing was going back, writing code making screenshots of that running in the browser and then sticking those recorded movies into Keynote. And so September, I was at a type conference in Belgium and getting really excited about more new stuff. I saw this incredible demonstration from Adidas. So I'll be showing you some stuff from them later. And, and so I got to thinking that the next talk that I was going to give was a short one at Design Week here in Rhode Island and I thought I would do something in the browser. And, and so on the way home, I, I wrote this thing and it ended up making a, like a 15 minute self-running animation in the browser showing all of these things that variable fonts can do and then gave a talk to, to people at Design Week about that just sort of running in the background and kind of talked through what was happening. And I really liked the way that came out. And so much so that I was thinking about conferences that I had in the following two weeks in Toronto and an event apart again in Orlando. And I decided to go for it. And so I rewrote the whole talk in HTML and CSS. So what you'll see today is running in the browser. It's live web fonts. It's the real thing. Um, as Eric Meyer put it, live without a net, as we can see. Um, but the point to me is to show what they can really do. Um, this is stuff that I've put into production. Um, it's going to be going into production for the state of Georgia in a few months uh, at scale. Um, these things can be put into practice now and really ch fundamentally change the way we're going about things. So, um, so I'm going to start a little bit by um, pausing for a moment to introduce Tristan and Tilly. Um, they'll be back. Uh, those of you who have seen my talks before, you've, you've met them, or at least you've met Tristan. 
Um, Tilly is Tristan's cousin, and uh, their size differential will become useful. Um, but they're my companions every morning when I start thinking about this stuff, and, and quite often when I start thinking about type and typography, I start looking backwards to get some inspiration for what we might do going forwards. So a bit about typography and why I think it's so important. In looking at this songbook, which was created by, by monks about 600 years ago, just the very appearance of this, the physicality of it, when you look at this, you know that it's special. You know by the illustrations, you know by the care that went into writing this out, and the fact that at the time, books were incredibly rare. So the very fact that there was one signified its importance, and that importance was carried through by the type that was, that was set. In this case, it's, it's calligraphy, but, but moving forward, this is right on the cusp of, of the printed word being created. And, and so going forward, um, we've always worked at ways to encode that beauty and meaning more and more. So this is actually coming forward a few hundred years to about a hundred years before now. Uh, these were drawings for a monotype matrix, and a monotype machine was what they call a hot metal type casting system, where these drawings would have encapsulate all of the different punctuation and accent marks that would be used with a given letter and all of that would be contained in that single matrix. So whatever was being typed out on this keyboard would be cast in hot metal and those individual pieces would be composited and then printed. So we've worked really hard over centuries to develop a way to consistently present a message in a given shape and form. And that shape and form went from letter forms on out to the printed proportions. Uh, in this book by Robert Bringhurst talking about exactly how and why you would structure a printed page. The margins, the length of the paragraph lines, the line spacing between them, the proportions of headings to the body copy, all of that systematized so that we could always create that perfectly typeset page. And so that perfectly typeset page, that idea of having one perfect solution was epitomized in this essay called The Crystal Goblet by Beatrice Ward. And uh, in 1932, when she wrote this, what she was putting forth is that there could possibly be this one perfect way to typeset a given piece of content, an essay, a book, that would shape the text without coloring it. That was the idea about Crystal, that you're giving it form, you're giving it this presentation, but you're not influencing what somebody takes away from that message by the type itself. There are some things that I agree with here, but the problem is type is never neutral. It always will influence the way you take this in, in some way, good or bad. Even trying to be as absent any kind of emotion, you still impart something. Because when you say I love you in Helvetica, you clearly don't mean it. <laughs> You're just putting the words out there. But a type obsessed hipster might put a little bit more style into it. But what actually resonates even more is this, the human hand. So we've been trying to get to the point where we can emote with the letter forms and accentuate the message. And that's something that I think is really critical because this is how we hear what we read. I think it's a very important concept. Every time you are looking at a message and taking it in, you are taking it in in a given context, a given frame of mind. And we're able to evoke that message and that, uh, that feeling based on the letter forms that have become familiar to us. So this book, um, I think, is a, a really good example of how sophisticated we can be in print. It's really beautifully typeset. This is a book by Bruce Kennett about W.A. Dwiggins, who actually grew up in Massachusetts in Hingham, and uh, was a really prolific and incredible designer, type designer, typographer, illustrator, um, really did a, a, a fantastic body of work in the earlier uh, part of the, the 20th century and uh, late 19th century, I believe. Um, but so, so Bruce typeset this book using typefaces that were designed by W.A. Dwiggins. You can see that beautiful capital A and the way that type just wraps around it. You'll notice all caps in the first few words. So these are various typographic devices that uh, we think of to introduce text and set you on your way. 
Um, and you see like these beautiful M dashes in here. If I were to zoom in a little bit, you'd probably see some really nice ligatures with like this FFI there. All of those beautiful touches about how we set type and convey this message to evoke the work of this man. Well, oh, I touched the smart board. Yeah. Um, we can do almost all of these things in the web. So this is a web page that also has a nice initial capital, and there's some really nice ligatures in here, and I'm not going to remember where, somewhere. Uh, but I set it so that the first line would always be in all caps. Um, we've got nice proportion from the, the headings to the subhead to uh, the byline there to the rest of the text. All of those things we can do on the web. The problem is to do it with the same level of emphasis and finesse it requires a lot of effort and a lot of files. So we're talking about lots of different files that end up getting loaded to get all of those different weights because the way fonts have always worked is that bold is one file, italics <coughs> another, bold italics a third. So we pull back and we don't really get our voice out there. And then we have to exist with a CMS at a point in time where the message is going to change tomorrow. So all the careful spacing and, and layout that we did with that headline disappears when they change the headline tomorrow. Or when we end up in a scenario where they need to add one more JavaScript and pull out something else, so they decide we'll pull out the web fonts altogether. Our design is something that has to survive these things. Our design has to be able to morph and it has to adapt, it has to have some fluidity and stretch to it in order to still maintain the cohesiveness of it. So the problem that we run into is as designers, we want to be very expressive, but as someone who is beholden to the user, we want to make sure that the experience is good and engineering is going to put pressure on us to reduce the number of assets that we use. So this idea of using all of these different font files, we get laughed out of the room. And that's, that's really sad. Um, I mean, it's understandable. As a UX designer, I care about getting the content on screen. As a communicator, I would like to be more finessed. Um, so, so what we've done is we've gone back to figuring out, all right, how do we then create a system of design that we can use on this website that will work with the content changing every day? And this is going to start to sound a little bit familiar, but when we look at those design systems, and I picked on two in particular, um, we have the, uh, the design system Polaris from Shopify, and you can see that in the typography section, they are talking about large and small screen. Now, one of the things that I've written about and spoken about for a long time is that with a responsive design, the scale of your type, the proportion of headings to body copy, needs to adapt based on the size of the screen and the amount of other stuff that you have to contend with as a user when you're trying to read it. So they've started to think about that. I don't think they've really gone far enough in this one-size-fits-all design system. Um, BBC, not surprisingly, has thought about it a little bit more. Um, they are all about content. In their global experience language, you can see there's all of these different combinations of, of type size and line height that are keyed to the kind of heading and the device upon which it's being viewed. So it's really important that they're being thoughtful about how the type is working, but they are also being very restrained with the number of weights and variants that they're using. Because they are nothing about, if not about performance. So, so it is this notion of trying to create this one system for everything. And that brought me onto this concept of average. And, and this is something that I, I really want to reinforce here, because in working on design systems and really trying to be thoughtful about creating this system that will handle all the content that goes into a, a Drupal website, we are really talking about averages. And so I was listening to this podcast a while back uh, from 99% Invisible, and it was talking about planes. It's talking about fatalities in, Air, in uh, Army Air Corps training accidents in the 40s. And they were on the rise. The war was over, but they were still losing a lot of pilots in training accidents, and they didn't really understand why that was happening. And UX research came to the rescue. They started digging into why was the cockpit designed that way. And of note, everything in the fighter pilot cockpit was fixed 
fixed in place. The controls, the seat, the adjustment, the shoulder straps, everything was designed around a series of average measurements. 10 different dimensions of measurements were taken from pilots in the 20s, and that's how they built the cockpit. Well, it turns out, when they actually compared all of the actual pilots they had in the 40s to those 10 standards of measurement, not a single pilot matched up on all of them, not one. When they increased, uh, decreased the number of measurements being matched down to three, they found 5% of the pilots. So what was going on is when they were optimizing for average, they were designing for no one. When we create a design system that is meant to house anything and everything we throw at it, we are optimizing for nothing. So we're not actually able to react to the specific when we've tried to create a system that will handle absolutely everything. So what we end up with is exactly the same proportions, exactly the same kind of layout. I could take that top little uh, text off of there, this could be any media site in the world. Now at least they've got dogs and not cats, sorry. <laughs> but, but that, um, this is my mission. I want to I, I get rid of the cat meme and replace it with the dog meme. And the dog yes. is helping, but, but you know, we got all to do our part. So I love the content, but this could be any site. And it doesn't matter what headline is in there, it's going to be exactly the same size, it's going to wrap however it wraps. We've not really done anything to actually allow in these wondrous platforms that we create to design and react for the specific content. So what we end up with is this. We've created a new crystal goblet. And so it's better and in no way do I want to disparage design systems. What we have to remember is they are the plateau. They are not the pinnacle. Having the design system is what's supposed to allow us to think further and go towards something even better. To allow us to skip over all of the mundane of having the content come out in at least a uniform and consistent and readable manner, but then extend what we have. We have the ability in Drupal to do so much more. We could actually create ways to typeset for the specific and give that control to a role within the content management system itself. That's something that I actually showed a couple years ago in Drupal at DrupalCon in Baltimore. Um, I'm not going to show that today because I really want to focus in on what is going to enable it. So variable fonts. And what you've been seeing are variable fonts on the screen and all of this animation is happening just in basic CSS. So a variable font is an evolution of the OpenType specification. So OpenType is, is what has allowed us to have one font file that can be installed on Mac or Windows, and then the wrapper around that, WAF, or Web Open Font Format, is what enables us to then run that on any browser. So WAF support is very, very high. WAF 2 is the next version of that that has much better compression. And what we have here is an evolution of the font format itself that works quite a bit differently. Now support has come along very well in the two years that this has been introduced. Every shipping browser on the desktop now supports it. Um, you are able to play around with it on Mac or Windows in core applications in certain circumstances. Um, there are a couple of applications now, Photoshop and Illustrator of Note, that actually have variable font support built in. And so what does that mean? What is that variable font? Well, it is all of these different widths and weights of those characters contained in one file. And that's really significant. What it's doing is it's not jamming everything together, it's actually storing the main shape of the character, and then for whatever the type designer has enabled, it is storing the offsets of the corner points and curve points from that standard character narrower and wider, and then exposing it to you as the user of that <coughs> font so that you can use CSS to say, I would like this to be 50% of the width or 110% of the width. And you can do all of that and animate it. So that gives us a lot of possibilities. And I'll show you what some of those possibilities are. And I wanted to bring back Tristan and Tilly again and show you exactly how we might do that and how it could look. Because we can do things like change the width or adjust the weight. Even in some cases, x height, 
So not every typeface will have that available, but the axes are here for us to do it. And of course, we can still do slant. Now, what the thing that is so remarkable to me about this is by having access to all of these things, we're able to start to tune the message and draw people's eye towards things and stop thinking in static instances of pages and start thinking, as Jen Simmons has talked about, in a more intrinsic way, something that is more of the web, but also blending that idea of motion and movement. There's no reason why we can't use that to better effect on the web and start to think about how might we draw people's eye around the screen. Think about time in addition to space. That got a little meta. But uh, we can also then react to context in multiple ways, not just based on screen size, as you saw here, but in this example. So we had Roslindale on the left. This is one called Sarah Pro from a, a, a German type foundry called Typemates. And we can do things with the width axis here to create a little bit better line wrap and reading experience without sacrificing type size. And we take that a step further with this one from Amstelvar. When we want to get into more, better editorial design, you look at this collision up here. That's not intended. Now, that could be artfully done in some cases, but it's usually not what the designer is looking for. They want a tightly set headline and they want to get that big, heavy impact, but they don't want to start overrunning the characters. Well, if you could tweak another axis of, say, perhaps the ascenders and descenders, you could avoid those collisions. And you could get this really beautifully typeset headline. And then you could also add a slightly narrower character and hyphenation to get, instead of 35 to 40 characters per line, easily fit 45 or 50 and have a much smoother reading experience so that longer form content becomes more comfortable. And of course, we don't always read in bright daylight. And as we introduced with Mojave, we might start thinking about what does that look like at night? Well, that's easy to do in one sense, that we have a media query now that's going to be supported. Uh, it's already in Safari. I think it's coming uh, in a couple other browsers pretty soon, reacting to user preference for this theme. But the problem is that type looks pretty weak. So when you reverse light and dark, if it's a fairly fine typeface, <laughs> That gets really hard to read. It'd be really nice if you could just sort of, um, let's see if that, there we go, increase the grade. So what I did there was there's another axis called grade, which is subtly increasing the weight of the typeface without the physical space that it occupies. So we can create a slightly stronger contrast without reflowing the design, better for night mode viewing, also better for users with low vision. So we start thinking about the applicability of this. It's not just design. It's not just about performance. It's about user experience and accessibility. That's all because of the typography. And that's really pretty profound. Oh, how much we can do. So what's the worth then to this design of this one asset that's being loaded? And you, know, you can do so much. That's way more important than some of the other assets you might be loading. You get much more value for the end user with that. So here's a little look at, at the insides of this. So you've got the standard shape of the character. And you see these points for a very thin but very wide, and then very thick and narrow. So what the format's doing is storing those points and the, the offset from that standard character. So it's a very efficient format. And I'm going to show you some, of the, uh, some comparisons here of just how efficient that might be. But I wanted to pause and talk about optical sizing. This is another one of the five sort of standard registered axes that exist in this font format. We've got width, weight, um, slant, and italic. They're slightly different. Slant allows you to go anywhere in between. Italic is on or off. Um, so the reason italic is on or off is because that is something that really requires glyph substitution, a bunch of other things. The design is not one that lends itself. But very often, sans serif typefaces can work anywhere in between. So that's why they chose to allow both of those things. Optical sizing is the fifth. Now, optical sizing, naturally, will go back 300 years and talk about this type specimen from William Caslon. This one um, shows a bunch of different specimens of the type at, a bunch, at different sizes. So we'll zoom in and kind of normalize that. And you can see up top, the 72-point version has a much finer contrast in stroke weight from the thick to the thin portions of the letter. Look at the sides and look at the top. 
on the bottom, you can see it's much more uniform because it's meant to be printed physically at one sixth the size of what's up top. One, no, one twelfth. There we go. Here's my math. Um, so that's a that's a pretty significant difference, and the reason for that is at a physically smaller size, those fine details can disappear either in crappy printing or on a low res screen or simply low light. So what they did was actually cut the letters differently. This was done very intentionally. So they were actually cutting these metal punches with a slightly thicker stroke weight when it was going to be at a physically smaller size. So when we take a look at Amstel VAR, with it forced to the lowest possible value for optical sizing so that this stuff stays readable, that looks OK, but it's not really the intent of the design. That is. So by enabling optical sizing, we get that beautiful fine detail up here without sacrificing readability down here. And this one is designed to actually work automatically. It's a new CSS property, font optical sizing. It's not supported by Chrome yet, but it is in all the other browsers. Um, you can also access it using font variation settings. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, the ability here to fine tune the usage of it and thicken it or, 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 or streamline it a little bit is really pretty remarkable. So not every typeface will lend itself to this. Not every typeface will ship with it. But those that do can provide a really beautiful level of detail in that large size where you can really appreciate it without sacrificing readability. So what does it look like? We'll look at a little bit of code. Um, the at font face declaration is really similar. We've added a word. And we've added ranges. So down here, where you're defining font weight, previously you would have an at font face declaration for every font file that you're loading. Regular, bold, bold, italic. And then you use those keywords to say, this is the bold one. So our font family is this. This stanza is for bold. This stanza is for regular. Here, we're giving the browser a clue. This has a weight range from 100 to 900. And I can use any value in between. It has a font stretch or width value of 75% to 100%. Font style oblique. Not many people have worked with this, but this is actually pre-existing. Um, font style oblique has been there for years. There just haven't been typefaces that support it very well. Now we can tell the browser what is the range. So then when we use it later, the browser will stay within these guideposts that we've given it. So those are some of the differences in how you would define the at font face declaration. And what I will point out also, when we start putting it into use, if you haven't used uh, CSS feature detection before, that now supports variable fonts. So you can actually wrap a little query around here, at supports, font variation settings none. Doesn't matter what that value is, just whether or not the browser can interpret it. And this will only be executed by browsers that support variable fonts. So you can put this in production today as an addition or an evolution of your typography without impacting older browsers one bit. But when the new browser does understand it, executes it, you can ensure that you've gotten all of your font declarations in there. You will never double load a font. So you're not going to incur some kind of performance uh, problem for your end user. So here's what it looks like. Instead of saying font weight bold, I can specify that very specific number. I can specify the stretch. I can specify the font style, italic or oblique, font optical sizing. When you set that to auto, which is the norm, that's the default value, the browser will attempt to match the optical sizing to the size at which you've displayed the text. Because it's not supported in Chrome yet, we're trying, but, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but uh, you can use this. So similar to font feature settings, I'm not sure if anybody's used that to set up open type features, font variation settings is what we call the lower level syntax, where you can actually specify weight, width, ital, uh, italic, optical size, and give it a number value. Now the problem is, when you do it this way, if you want to change one of those values, you've got to redeclare the whole string. You can't just change one of them, unless you're using a CSS variable. If you use a CSS custom property to, for that value, then you can actually just update that one variable, and it will work just fine. Um, that's getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I just wanted to make sure that was there. Also note case. Case is important here. The registered axes that I mentioned, need to be in lowercase. Custom axes need to be in uppercase. 
So what is a custom axis? A custom axis is anything the type to face designer wants to support. So we have three there, grade, G-R-A-D, um, Y transparent ascender and descender. So I'm not going to get into the Y transparent part of that X and Y axis because even I can't follow that. But the important thing is ascenders and descenders. That's what I was showing, keeping the, uh, the bits of the letters from colliding when you have the type set really closely. So those are in uppercase, and I'm supplying that value. The other ones up above uh, are, uh, are in lowercase, indicating it's a registered axis. So I wrote a lot about this for uh, MDN website, Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, there's a whole guide there with tons of examples embedded in it that you can learn tons about. Um, don't worry, I'll actually tweet out a link to this with all the resources afterwards. I have it all up on Noticed, including an embed of the slides themselves. Um, so that's all there already, actually, on uh, linked from my website. But I'll, I'll, I'll share that later. Um, but I also wanted to point out, one, how beautifully these animations are rendering in Firefox. If you have not tried it, you really should. Uh, they have also introduced some new developer tools, which are really pretty fantastic. And these were actually a sketch file passed to me in April, and this is now shipping code. There's a third panel that when you, when you select a variable font, it's going to give you all of the axes of variation and let you change them live in the browser and then copy that selected CSS back into your project. So this is cool stuff. You've got to play around with that. It's worth using it for development for that feature alone. Um, because one of the things about variable fonts is it's a little tough to discover still what they can do. So by just dropping it in a page, sticking it in an, an H element, you can then look in your browser locally and figure out everything that, ha that it can do. It gives you the low and the high end value. It tells you what the four, four letter strings are, uh, the, the keyword tags that go with it. Uh, it gives you everything that you need to be able to work with that. It also has this. What I haven't talked about is the notion of named instances. So within the way fonts were created, they would, you would have a file for condensed bold. You have a separate file for extended thin. So those are what the typeface designer had in mind. All of those still exist. We've simply exposed all of it in a single file. The named instance is the way for the type designer to give you a hint what combination of axes made sense to them. There's also some work being done on the W3C to figure out how we can tie into those named instances in CSS. That's still very much in flux, but um, you can actually still just pick it here and then copy the values that you get. And if you really want to go with what the typeface designer intended for a compressed bold weight, then that will give you the cues that you need. Um, so this is an example that I designed for Monotype. This was for the launch of FF Meta, which is their very first variable font. And so what we wanted to do, we had this one file that had just a weight axis and italics. And so the challenge that I set for myself with this is, one, write something meaningful that explains it. So this essay actually is about variable fonts and understanding the format. But I wanted to typeset it in a way that I could feel really, really proud of, of the typesetting and the design and see how far I could push that one weight, that one axis of the type. So this is all a single file that's generating all of the copy on this page. And it's all, of course, responsive and scaling and fluid. And then um, what you also end up getting to see is that is one 84K file instead of 18 different files that would have totaled well over 300K this was all done with a single 84K file. Is that compressed or uncompressed? Um, well, it's, it's in WAF2 format. Okay. So that is, um, that's as delivered. Um, and when you think about uh, what's quite often the case on a website, um, I can give you some concrete examples. Um, if you look at the homepage of fidelity.com, they're loading four or five weights of their own custom typeface. That's to the tune of two to 250K. Uh, if you look at the Wall Street Journal, where they're loading probably 10 different fonts for their, their custom typeface, there's over 600K of font data. Um, most people will 
I think most people end up settling around 100 to 150 k as an, a reasonable line item in their performance budget. And I, and I think most of us have figured that we can supply five or six different fonts that will fit in there that will give us everything for our body copy and something else for headings. And so that's, you know, I think it's a, a fairly generally accepted target. When we're able to do this much with just one file for even less, we, we have fewer HTTP requests, we have less data, and we have an infinitely greater design vocabulary. Like there's so many wins that we get to get out of this. Um, what I also incorporated in that was um, something else that I wanted to talk about, which is a new way of thinking about the typesetting itself. So we have this huge level of variability. I can't avoid that word, really. So it's not exactly a pun, but maybe a little. Um, in, in what we can do with width and weight and all these other characteristics. But what I wanted to do is also make sure that we're thinking about the typography and typesetting itself. So what I've always written about in the past was at small screen you might do this, at a less, slightly larger screen you might do this, and, and have these set of pixel values or M equivalents that we're assigning our type based on media queries or rough breakpoints as the screen gets bigger. Well, that's okay, but it's also a little bit limiting and, and it's not really taking into account what happens when it gets even bigger, what happens with all of these other in-between sizes. So, Tim Brown wrote about this idea called CSS locks. How many people have worked with viewport units for text? So viewport units, really interesting. Um, 100 viewport width units or VW units uh, is the, the, si the size of the window at all times. And by sizing your type in viewport width units, it will scale smoothly with the window. And as we looked at in the workshop yesterday that I was teaching about theming, that can lead to some awkward scenarios where your heading is now smaller than your body copy on a narrow screen. Not optimal. Turns out you also can't zoom the text. That's a big screw up. So that's something that I didn't even think about until I think Estelle Weil tweeted about this a couple weeks ago. And, and that's a huge accessibility issue. What this does is it takes the idea of viewport width units but also combines it with a lock, a low end and a high end value where it cannot scale any smaller and it can't scale any bigger. And we're able to do that in the browser because CSS now supports calculations. And when you combine calculations with CSS variables, you start to get some really interesting possibilities that you can then also tie into your variable fonts. So we start out by defining a couple of variables. There's going to be math. I'm just letting you know. Not that much. So We've defined, and these are, in my head, corresponding to M values. And what I need is a unitless value, so I have not put the M uh, suffix on there, because I'm going to do some things with that. I'm also deciding that I want a minimum size for my H1 to be 5M and 10M at the large size. It's going to be a little bit of a big scale, but that's fine. We then do something like this. So up here, pretty basic. We're designing mobile first, no, mo no media queries. What by default is the H1 going to be? That minimum times 1M. So that equates to 5M. Pretty simple. At the high end, when we get to 75M or wider, it's a fairly large screen. Um, usually it's just going to be on your desktop. We go max size 1M. So anywhere from mobile and then desktop, that's kind of where our extremes in the range are. This covers anything and everything in between. As soon as you hit that break point, basically as soon as you turn your phone sideways, this is going to start doing math for you. The cool thing is you never have to rewrite this formula. All you have to do is redefine variables. So it's starting out by saying, what's my min and my max? We're adding those things together. We're doing a little math. We're taking viewport width units. And then we're doing a little bit more math, dividing the low end and the high end, where we want the scaling to stop and start. The end result of this is a smoothly calculated number from 5 to 10, anywhere in that range. It will always work. And any browser that supports variable fonts supports CSS variables and calculations. You get them all. So when you tie your typography this way, you've got your variable font and you can actually start to use some ideas like this to vary the font itself. So 
note about the math that you need. This ends up with an m value because that's what we're using for these multipliers. So that's what wins out from variable uh, VW units into m's. If we're using a percent value instead, we could now be modifying our font stretch. So we can use the same kind of calculations to make the text a little bit narrower, a little bit wider as you change the screen size. So that's one way you might vary your type. It's not always going to be the answer, but that's one way you might do it. The problem is if we wanted to vary our weight, that needs to be expressed in a unitless value. This doesn't work yet. Currently, there's no way to use calc that introduces a unit and not end up with a unit attached to that number at the end. That has actually been edited in the CSS spec because we complained a lot about this and asked for it, and that will be implemented in browsers soonish. I don't really know when, but I've been mentioning this a bunch of times now. This is a participatory process. All of the discussion about the W3C takes place on GitHub, and we can all comment, and that's what they want. So all of these issues are being discussed there. By bringing it up there and talking about it and asking for it and making the case for it, just all of us everyday designers or developers have the chance to be a part of shaping this standard as it evolves. With all of these things and all of this writing, I've been in contact with all of the different browser vendors, and we've had bugs logged and fixed based on these little use cases. So I'm just a guy who was interested in this stuff and spoke up. I speak about it a lot, so more people might know who I am, but it doesn't matter. That's what's so amazing about this. Any one of us in this room can go log a bug, bring this thing up, and say, hey, Chrome team, this is not behaving in the same way. And then we have an issue, and we can raise it up. We can tweet about it. More of us can go comment on it. And before you know it, there's enough critical mass there to make a change. And that's what's been driving this stuff forward. We have type allies at these browsers right now because everybody wants to see this succeed. Everybody's really pretty excited about it. So when you raise these things up, you get answers right away. And that's really kind of amazing. So, so the, the heart of this is a typographic system that has less code because I'm not writing something for every media query. I'm copying this formula in. Or if you're using SAS, you've just made a mix in. And so then it's super easy to do. And then we can apply that to all of our different headings and have a typographic system that scales across any device throughout the whole system. It works in design systems. It works in one-offs. Um, and I know this to be true because I've built it that way. And, and so then the neat thing is, because you have these things assigned as variables at the root level, if you want, for example, uh, we've, we're taking this H1 and we're putting it in a small card in a sidebar. All we have to do is scope it in like sidebar H1, reassign those two variables, it's going to calculate the same way. So it's really flexible and really fast and really easy to maintain. And when you're thinking about this as a theming level system for, um, uh, for something like Drupal, this is really kind of ideal to have that design system with a themable layer that you can access by just writing a little bit of stuff into your admin experience to output a small style sheet that reassigns some variables. That's pretty cool. You could actually have a typographic system that could be edited within the CMS. Um, so I wanted to show you what that looked like in practice. So we've got Avenir next. It's another variable font that's coming from, uh, from Monotype. And this is designed to use that same system scaling smoothly between every breakpoint. So that, I mean, the animation just slows it down so you can actually see what's happening, but we've got width and weight and size, all of that stuff scaling smoothly across <coughs> all those different screen sizes. There's also the notion of time. So Underwear sent me this demo where that typeface has one axis and it is time. And you can use that to draw the strokes of the character. And what's really significant about this is in English, it just looks like somebody writing it. In Chinese, it is critical that you get the order of those strokes correct. That adds to the meaning of what you're writing. So the fact that they can do this in Chinese, let me show you that again. Because this is really pretty cool. Watch the strokes as it draws in. There's ink game. 
I mean, there's really a lot of beautiful little touches here. Mm -hmm. but, but the important thing is they can encode the stroke order in the font. That actually becomes a writing teaching tool. So the type is not only shaping our emotion, it's informing our user experience, it's making it a more beautiful experience, and it's a teaching tool to boot. I mean, what can variable fonts do? Lots, but, but still. It's really pretty amazing to me that we can actually do that much with it. But wait, there's more. So uh, this was a demonstration that I saw at TypeCon a couple years ago in Boston. Uh, this young woman, uh, Sahar Afshar from, uh, I think she's Iranian. Gosh, I really hope I'm not getting it wrong. Anyway, fantastically talented type designer giving this talk. Uh, she was talking about sort of uh, historical aspects of Arabic typography. And what you're seeing here, that is a stroke called a kashida. And that is used in Arabic to do one of two things. It is used, I mean, apart from being a connecting stroke between phrasing, it's used to help justify text. So it can be used absent semantic meaning, simply to create a better aesthetic layout. So it's used in calligraphy a lot. Uh, but it can also be in, used as a way to inform how you read something. So in poetry, it might be used to actually inform the pacing of how you're writing that. And it would be pretty fantastic if that was an actually variable axis. That's live type running in an animation. And it does actually have a variable axis. And so they did one better. She worked on this um, with uh, Jose Sole and another fellow whose name I'm not remembering. But they extended this. So I saw that uh, about two years ago at TypeCon in Boston. And then forward uh, last May at Typo Labs in Berlin, they showed this. This is, again, live in the browser. Those little reddish highlights there are the endpoints of the Kushida that you can go into the browser and click and drag. Typesetting in the browser, visually, telling you what you can work on. That's kind of astonishing. So when you think about what is, what is the mechanism by which we work with type, it's the browser. It's in the medium in which we are working. When we want to adjust this block of Arabic type, you go into this edit mode, and you just click and drag. That just kind of blew me away. I mean, this is a snapshot of the future. When you look at this and you look at uh, one of the other resources that I'll have a link to um, is this young uh, woman, Wenting, who works at Adobe on the, the Typekit team, or Adobe Fonts team now. Um, she made this website called uh, her, um, well, it's a little web font playground thing. But basically, she created a different way of working with axes where two of them might be plotted on a graph. And you just drag a point around the middle, and it adjusts both of those axes together. She's really pretty brilliant. She again, like she showed this to me like a sketch in June, and she launched the site like a month and a half ago. It's an entirely different paradigm for how you work with type. It was just, it was an idea. She thought it would work. She made it. And I just think this is incredible time for us to be thinking about how all of this stuff evolves. That should be in a CMS. Wenton's designs should be in a CMS. That we should be able to. Put in any content, now typeset for this specific content. All you're storing is a tiny little style sheet that goes with it. That's really powerful stuff. So what about not print? They can actually, uh, I'm sorry, not web. Um, that would have been so much better if I got that right. Uh, <laughs> I'll admit, when I heard about this format, it to me had nothing to do with print. I did not care. I was sitting in a room full of people that were all very print-centric looking at this thing. And they were really impressed. They were very excited about it. All I could think was, what can we do with that on the web? Holy cow. What just happened? <laughs> oh my god. Oh, just, wow. Just type in your password, Jason. Yeah, it'll be fine. What could go wrong? Oh, this is going to make me really sad. But uh, Oh, there we go. Hopefully, it, I don't know what just happened. So, um, so I saw that, and, and it just blew me away what we could do with that on the web. I mean, the possibilities for type and design and vocabulary were pretty incredible. Well, Adidas thought differently. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Mickle, the type designer, uh, actually 
went to RISD, now lives out in LA, he's got a really fantastic design studio there, has worked with Leon and Moss at Adidas for a long time. He's the head of their global brand. And Leon is a super smart guy who has been thinking about type a lot because it is at the absolute core of the Adidas brand. So when that format was introduced, he immediately started thinking about that. He'd been working with Jeremy to extend the core typeface, the brand typeface for Adidas, or Adidas, um, from those initial few letters into a whole typeface. And Jeremy did the, the artwork for that. And they used that as their core brand typeface. But they wanted to be able to use it more. So they took that core brand typeface and they had Jeremy turn it into a variable font. So he had all of these different widths and weights. And they went further with that design space and they stretched it. And so they ended up deciding that they could take that basic character form and, and they could just turn it into something that could be as dynamic and exciting as the brand itself. So that one typeface can do stuff like this. But again, that's all animated text in the browser from one file. But that's not the only typeface they made. They also do a lot of uniforms. They do a lot of uniforms. They do have custom uniforms for all kinds of schools and teams and organizations all over the world. Well, think about what goes on the back of a uniform or the front, the name. The name of the team, the name of the school, the name of the athlete. Think about Tom Brady versus any hockey player. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you think of like, because, you know, they're probably for, from like Czechoslovakia or something, and they've got 37 letters in their last name. Gosh, what could a font do if you could change the width and actually maintain the characteristics of it when you use it? you know, on the back of a jersey. So, so they looked at their use, uses of it in broadcast and in print to create this really dynamic message. Think about their ads. This is the kind of thing that they do. And think about what they put on the back of those uniforms. So they made another variable font. And you think sports, you think those chopped angles on the, on the sides of the letter forms. It's Adenoia Chop. And they made a variable font version of that. So I was looking in their brand annual and seeing some of the, uh, the, the layouts that they made in there in print using Adenoia Chop. And it really, uh, it was really beautiful. It was a compelling um, layout and a really compelling phrase. You know, our, we can change lives with the power of sport. And um, could do stuff like that. And again, that's one typeface. That's all in a browser. Think about how we could change messages and really do something interesting and exciting in the design of it. And that's all still one phrase. So a screen reader is just going to read a sentence. We haven't cost anything in SEO. We haven't cost anything in usability or readability or accessibility. But we've created this message that moves you. So we can stop thinking about heading, body copy, sidebar, image, and on and on and on and on. We can actually create layouts. We can do interesting things that evoke, not just through the shape of the letters, but the placement and the movement of them. And that stuff really excites me a lot. So this is all unlocking a whole new way of thinking about working with type and design and, and really trying to get past where we've really been stuck for 20 years in the sequential listing of elements of content on the screen. And so the, the font, the, the number of fonts uh, is limited right now. There's probably not more than 100, 150 commercial, commercially viable um, variable fonts out there yet. But there's more coming. And part of that clue is on the screen. And that clue is the number one web font of all time that is in use in millions upon millions of, of websites. And I got to bugging the guy that designed it and asked him and asked him and asked him if this would be real, if he would actually be interested in doing this. And, and he's, a, he's a pretty open guy. He's super nice. And um, I asked him about it when I was at the type conference in September. And I asked him again right before I was heading off to uh, an event apart in Orlando. And I asked him about it on Wednesday. And Friday, he sent me a file. And I asked him, what do you think? Like, could I, could, I, could I show that? That was his response. Mark Simonson, the creator of Proxima Nova, the most popular web font of all time, 
sent me this file after a couple of days of noodling around with it. Now let me tell you a little bit more about it. I mean, first of all, that's really freaking cool on a lot of levels. It's an amazing typeface. This typeface has 1,400 glyphs in it. It can, I mean, it is so complete. It can handle so many different languages, different character sets, alter, uh, alternate characters, all of these things. 1,400 glyphs. This was replacing 96 files from about 3,000K, so about three megabytes, to a 300K file. He hasn't done anything to optimize it yet. This is totally beta. And, you know, this is not ready for sale yet, but a tenth the size for about a million times what you can do with it in any language with the most popular typeface of all time. And it's because we asked. Type designers are just waiting to hear. They want the demand. So pricing, yes, it's hard to figure out. But getting the typefaces, we just need to ask. So when I showed this, somebody came up with me afterwards saying, like, how do I, well, one of the questions was, how do, I, how do I get one? We had a custom typeface designed for us, and um, how do we make it variable? What could we do? And my answer was just ask the guy who did it, who did it. And he came up with me afterwards, and he said, well, it's this guy, Jeremy Mickle. Oh, that's a familiar name. So within five minutes, the guy had an email to Jeremy Mickle from me introducing him, saying, hey, they were really curious about this. And Jeremy wrote back about 10 minutes later and said, that would be really cool. So I don't know if it's really going to happen, but it's as easy as that to make the connection. And that's the thing that I love about this, is these people are all people. They're all accessible. They're interested. Uh, Google is funding this stuff. Type Network is funding this stuff. Monotype is working on, on this. I've, I've worked with two two publicly known variable fonts from Monotype, and a third one that they just sent me that's in a completely different genre. I, have not, I did not really see that one coming at all. Um, that one will be public in another month or so. Um, so there's a lot of interest and a lot of exciting and interesting things happening. And, and I think the beauty of it is we're in the middle of it. We can use so much of this stuff right now, and it's still at a point where we can have an impact on it. And you have a typeface that you're using, and you're excited about it, if you don't know who to ask, ask me. And then we'll make a connection. We'll figure out who it is. Um, uh, Western University in Ontario had a designer at an event apart. We started talking. They used Benton Sands. That's from Type Network. I know Type Network is working on that. We made a connection. Developer from Pella Windows asked me about this. Turns out they used Avenir. And they're really working on incorporating that throughout their brand. That is number two for Monotype. It's already available. And they're working on making a release version of it. Made a connection there. They're talking about it. They're going to see what they can do. Um, and another one was, um, oh, I just totally lost it. Uh, Western University, Avenir. Um, well, actually, Mark Simonson. Because this project I'm working on at the state of Georgia uses Proxima Nova, and we're using Source Serif as, as the pairing there. Source Serif is available as a variable font. Proxima Nova, maybe. So, you know, we're just kind of piecing these things together, and, and people are really excited about it. And they want to make these things happen and see how it works and see where it goes. And, and so it's, it's really pretty exciting to be a part of that. These words have power. And we want the type to match that and amplify it and take it even further. Thank you very much. Um, I don't really have a whole lot of time for questions, but you could ask one really quick. <laughs> uh, the custom axes, are those things that are set like by the type designer? And so like, does that mean kind of every variable font has like documentation or the ones that have custom axes? Yeah. That would be the ideal. Um, so, uh, so, so no, the <laughs> discoverability is like that is one of the biggest challenges. So um, in, the, in the resources that I'm going to send out, um, there are a number of websites that you can use. Um, that either have variable fonts there that you can play with. There's also one, um, actually I have a little sticker for it on the back of my laptop, top top. Um, what can my font do? <laughs> he's, he's Belgian, so it actually sounds a lot cooler when he says it, but um, what can my font do? And so you drop, you load up the page, you drag and drop a font onto that page and inspect it, and it gives you a whole specimen page with all the axes there and all the values. And um, So it's very easy to find out. Um, you can also just drop it into a page and open it in Firefox. Um, but obviously, you want to know what it is before you get it. 
So Access Praxis is a website that has a lot of them, and v-fonts.com from Nick Sherman is kind of a catalog site. Um, so I've got a ton of those things listed out. It's all up on Noticed, uh, where I've got this embedded, and I'll, I'll tweet out a link to that momentarily, so you'll have tons of stuff to work with. Thank you. You're welcome. Do all versions of Firefox have the variable font stuff on it? Or it yes, it's shipping now. Oh, okay. It's good. not the nightly Sweet. build anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that is, it's been an amazing transformation. So that was literally a sketch file in April that was given to me the day that I was going on stage there. And then it was in the nightly build within about eight weeks. And then it shipped three weeks ago. Um, so there's tons of support for variable fonts and better typography coming from, uh, from Mozilla. Um, I also wrote a guide for them on font features, um, so kerning and open type features and stuff like that. So there's a pair of guides there about variable fonts and uh, open type stuff. I've got a ton of stuff on CodePen, including that essay for monotype that's all there that you can copy and play around with and do whatever you want. So um, just look for Jay Pomentel on Twitter, on CodePen, GitHub. There's tons of stuff for you to play with. It's, uh, a lot of it is open source. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The red button. Also, I'm going to ask you the red button.